Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Before the world was made, before you spoke it to be, you were the King of kings, yeah you were, yeah you were, and now you're reigning still, enthroned above all things. Angels and saints cry out, we join them as we sing, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Creator God, you gave me rest, so I praise your great and matchless name. All my days, all my days, so let my whole life be a blazing offering. A life that shouts and sings the greatness of our King. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Take my life and let it be all for you and for your Take my life and let it be yours. Take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God forever. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God forever. Take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours. Take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours. Let it be yours. To God be the glory, great things He hath done. So loved He the world that He gave us His Son, who yielded His life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He hath done. Great things He hath taught us, great things He hath done. And great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give Him the glory, great things He hath done. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, enlightened, accessible, Thy great name we praise, unresting, unhasting, and silent as thine, nor wanting, nor wasting, thou rulest in might, thy just 
makes all seasons, but I sure like the one this morning. Wasn't it nice? Yes, yes. We want to welcome all of you. We're so happy that you're here. Well, you're welcome. Well, uh, it's our pleasure. And we're so glad if you're visiting with us today. Uh, we want to you to stick around and get to know you a little bit better. Our worship today is live streamed for those that cannot be with us. And it's also recorded. You can watch it later in the week. We have hosts online and uh, there to pray with that community online as well. We want to know you're here, so we have our digital connect card. So please uh, scan that QR code. It's also, as you walk in, that QR code is out in the atrium. If you prefer a paper card, those are right there in your seat. You can fill those out and drop them in the offering box as you exit the worship center. If you'd like to follow along in today's worship, you can use the YouVersion app. You scan that. You'll see all the events and today's worship along with song, the songs that we're singing. If you prefer paper song sheets, we have those also out in the atrium at the information desk. Today, I have the pleasure of helping us celebrate those with wedding anniversaries during the month of October. And if you're visiting with us, we want you to join along in our celebration. I'd like to bring to your attention on the screen our special couple who's been married the longest, Mike and Judy Smith, 61 years on October 20th. Wow, that's awesome. And now on the screen, we'll see we don't have any new 20s years that came up, but we do have all of these folks who are celebrating 20 plus years. And if you're here, will you please stand up? No one is here that is celebrating their 20 plus. Okay, anyone else that has a wedding anniversary in October, please stand and let us celebrate you. Would you pretend you have an anniversary? No, just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> Yay, Royals, glad you're here. All right. I was going to say everybody be seated, but okay. Well, to continue in worship, I'm blessed to be able to take us in a time of prayer. And following the prayer, we will have a special video from our shepherds. So if you'll go to me and with me in prayer to God. Father God, thank you for being our Almighty, our Maker, our Creator, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, and the end. God, you are good, you are faithful, and we are frail and broken. We are sinners, and we ask you for forgiveness. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. We pause to remind ourselves of a profound truth. You are in control. When circumstances become overwhelming, we rest in knowing that you, God, hold us all together. We come to you today and we lay at your feet our dear sisters, Meredith Kelly and Jill Hill. God, we know that your spirit has been working and will continue to do so as these ladies prepare for surgery this week. What a beautiful gift our sweet friend Jill is giving of a kidney donation. The gift is allowing Meredith, this precious wife, mother, daughter, 
sister and friend, to continue her journey here on this earth. Jill and Meredith are your children, and they love you, and they want to serve you in all they do. I ask that you give Jill and Meredith's families the peace that only you can give. May they feel comfort knowing you are in control. Lord, I lift up the medical team who will be performing the many surgeries. We know you are present, and we trust you will give them wisdom, strength, and skills to do their best work for all during this process. Take control, Father God. Teach us to submit our lives to you. May we abide in you each and every day. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hello, Northside family. For those of you that don't know me yet, my name is Alan Cooper, and I'm one of the nine shepherds here at Northside. A number of years ago, we developed a method of keeping you up to date on the behind the scenes happenings here, and we called it shepherd sharing. At its high point, we were gathering quarterly on Sunday evenings to give you updates and to answer your questions, but we've come to realize two major problems with that method of communication. First, in today's culture, it's unrealistic to, to expect large gatherings on Sunday evening, especially when you've all already committed to participating in life groups at various times during the week and to being here on Sunday mornings and Wednesday evenings. Second, the format of a one-hour meeting with us all seated in the worship center just doesn't lend itself well to shepherd listening and to good productive question and answer sessions. With that in mind, our new plan is multifaceted, and my job today is to kick that plan off with the video communication that, while is only providing one-way communication, will at least keep you up to speed on what's going on with your leadership team. Look for other opportunities for two-way communication soon. But with that said, I'd like to get this new plan underway with what will be, at minimum, monthly videos from your Northside Shepherds on topics such as vision, pastoral care, generosity, and other important topics. Undoubtedly, the biggest thing that's happened since our last Shepherd Sharing event, outside of the Sessions family joining us, is the implementation of the Northside vision and its strategic plan and initiatives. Beginning back in the pre-COVID timeframe with the vision work groups that many of you participated in, we've been very intentional with the development and communication of the Northside vision. Even the selection of David Sessions to be our minister of the word was vision driven. We intentionally front loaded the strategic plan with initiatives related to spiritual formation and the shepherds are currently working on ways to recognize and cultivate spiritual maturity in themselves and in the church as a whole. As an example, David just led us through an exercise in our last meeting in which we all shared a time when we saw the Spirit working on and through us, both individually and as a church family. As you've heard over the past few weeks, an executive minister search committee has been formed and their goal is to find the best candidate possible to step into this vital role that Jack Reese is preparing to leave behind. Northside has benefited greatly through Jack's work as our executive minister. I'll mention that just one of those ways has been the freedom that it's given the shepherds to focus less on business and more on the pastoral care of the church family. The committee is now busy working on job description, qualifications, and personal characteristics for our next executive minister, all with the intentionality for that administrative position to be able to work ever so closely with David on the implementation of our vision and strategic plan. I wanna keep this message as brief as possible, but before closing, I do wanna mention that we're approximately $200,000 behind in our budgeted giving as we enter the fourth quarter. Now, that's not totally unusual for our giving patterns here, but some of you have already committed your year-end givings towards the finish out of the adult ed area upstairs, and that means we'll need everyone to step up and help us make up this year-end shortfall. 
As an FYI, the finish out is long overdue because our youth ministry is once again busting at the seams under the leadership of Ben Crane and his team. And our original intention when we built this facility was to borrow the youth area classrooms for adult ed only for the first few years. All in all, our future is bright and each and every one of you is a big part of the reason for that. Hebrews 11.1 tells us, now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance in what we do not see. Be confident and assured, Northside. Thank you to Alan Cooper for recording that video for us. Um, that's very helpful. And we will be sharing this uh, via email and social media this week for those who are unable to be here today. Um, folks, I want you to know how grateful I am for our shepherds uh, and their leadership of this church. That is truly a blessing to be able to serve alongside them. Let's continue our worship in song. Let us adore the ever-living God and render praise unto Him who spread out the heavens and established the earth and whose glory is manifest throughout all the earth. He is our God. He is our God. There is no one else. He is our God. higher. Um, we will continue that thought uh, with our next song, which is uh, probably new to many of us. Uh, we haven't sung it here in the worship service before, but um, I think it's worth singing. And so if this is new to you, feel free to um, focus on the, the lyrics at first, if you like. Um, make sure you're you're hearing the message of the song, and then feel free to join in uh, whenever you're ready. Uh, let's sing No One Higher together. Our Father, Creator, you hold our hearts together. There's no one higher than you. 
Redeemer, Defender, our great and mighty Savior. There's no one higher than you. You are always with us, gracious to forgive us. By your power we've been set free. Lord, we stand amazed in your presence, astounded by your mercy and love. Our hands are lifted high in surrender. Your grace for me is always enough. There is no one higher than our God. There is no one higher than you. Let my life forever praise the glory of your name. There is no one higher than you. Majestic in wonder, you reign in love forever. There's no one higher than you. Your beauty, your splendor, your glory knows no measure. There's no one higher than you. You are always with us, gracious to forgive us. By your power we've been set free. Lord, we stand amazed in your presence, astounded by your mercy and love. Our hands are lifted high in surrender. Your grace for me is always enough. There is no one higher than our God. There is no one higher than you. Let my life forever praise the glory of your name. There is no one higher our Savior, great and glorious. There is no one higher, no one greater, no one like our God. There is none more able, Christ our Savior, great and glorious. There is no one higher, no one greater, no one like our God. There is none more able, Christ our Savior, great and glorious. Lord, we stand amazed in your presence, astounded by your mercy and love. Our hands are lifted high in surrender. Your grace for me is always enough. There is no one higher than our God. There is no one greater than you. Let my life forever praise the glory of your name. There is no Church, would you pray with me? Our God and our Creator, in the beginning, you created the heavens and the earth. You separated the light from the darkness. By your words and by your voice, the sky was separated from the seas, and the lands rose out of the waters. And by your strength, the pillars that you've set up hold us where we are, apart from the chaos. You've separated 
you've separated us and you've created life where there was no life. You've built up everything around us. You've placed all of creation in its own reasonable order, God. And we sometimes forget in 2023 that you're still the one keeping every single thing together. God, there is no one higher than you. There is no one greater than you. You created human from dust, and it's your spirit, it's your breath that sustains us. God, one day these bodies will return to dust when it's your will. We place our lives in you. You're the creator and the sustainer of life. You give and you take away. And there is no one that we would rather trust and put our entire future and our entire life inside. God, we are so thankful for the relationship that you've called us into. And we just put you in the highest place and tell you that you are the greatest. There's none above you. God, we serve you with every breath that we have. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're able, please stand for the reading of God's word. Exodus 11, 1 through 10. The Lord said to Moses, I will bring one more plague upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go from here. Indeed, when he lets you go, he will drive you away. Tell the people that every man is to ask his neighbor and every woman is to ask her neighbor for objects of silver and gold. The Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, Moses, Moses himself was a man of great importance <coughs> in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's officials, and in the sight of the people. Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go, through, go out through Egypt. Every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne to the firstborn of the female slave who is behind the hand mill, and all the firstborn of the livestock. Then there will be a loud cry throughout the whole land of Egypt, such as has never been or ever will ever be again. But not a dog shall growl, and at any, at any of the Israelites, not at people, not at animals, so that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. Then all these officials of yours shall come down to me and bow low to me, saying, Leave us, you and all the people who follow you. After that, I will leave. And in hot anger, he left Pharaoh. The Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you in order that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. Moses and Aaron performed all of these wonders before Pharaoh. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let the Israelites go out of his land. This is the word of God for the people of God. To say this is the word of God for the people of God, this is a, this is a hard text. Um, this is the, the plague that Moses and Aaron do not perform. This, in various ways, is the work of God and God alone. I appreciate so much of worship this morning. I appreciate Luke's prayer. I mean, it, it is uh, exactly where I intended to start this morning, and, and the idea of God as creator, because Exodus has to be understood as a continuation of the creation story. There in, in the creation, the beginning of time, Israel testifies that God created the world with his words that God holds the power of world creation in his breath. And that when God spoke, everything that we know, everything that we love, 
came into being. We are quite comfortable with God as creator, as God is not just the one who created, but the continual creator. It's comforting to us to know that this morning as the sun rose on San Antonio and it was not 95 degrees at 7 o'clock in the morning, uh, yeah, th- there's a creator that's continually recreating with his very breath. This, this is the God that, that then came to meet Abraham. Abram changed his name to Abraham with the covenant that I will be your God and that though you and your wife are old in old age, you will have many children. And in fact, look up to the stars in the skies, if you can count them, or the sand on the seashore, if you can count those, that's how many of your descendants there will be. Well, three or four generations later, we're here at Jacob and, and his 12 sons, Joseph. Joseph goes to Egypt. He's sold into slavery into Egypt, but because of his faith in God and his, his loyalty to God's covenants, God's done what God will promise, both in creation and a covenant, that the people of God will multiply, that they'll be fruitful and healthy. And here in Egypt, though he was sold into slavery, Joseph has become a friend of Pharaoh and has helped his family survive the worldwide famine. And at this point, Jacob and all his descendants, he's in this lineage of people that will become uh, descendants so numerous that there are as many as the stars in the heaven. At this point, there are 70. There are 70 people that come with Jacob when Jacob and his other sons are reunited with Joseph. And then Jacob is buried like a king of Egypt when he dies. But a pharaoh that does not know Jacob is, is risen up, becomes in charge, and the very thing, the very thing that Israel is doing to show covenant faithfulness, that becoming many, is the very thing that makes this pharaoh afraid, and he decides that they will go back to being slaves in Egypt. We're not exactly sure how long, as Moses has come along, as Aaron and Moses have gone to Pharaoh and, and asked him to let my people go, we're not exactly sure how long this slavery has, has been happening. If you're so the sort of person that likes to follow along, we're going to be in chapter 11, but also chapter 12 uh, this morning. And there at the end of chapter 12, we learn that it has been 430 years since Israel was enslaved. 430 years. I'm not good at mental math, so I went and did this with a calculator. Uh, That is, oh man, I'm drawing a blank on the number right now. 15, what is it? 430 years minus this year is 15 to 29. No, 19. 15, dang it. 1579. Let's say that. It's the 1500s. It's the late 16th century. That's how long 430 years is, and I did that, and I'm failing right now in this moment in front of all of you, because we don't understand the scope of 430 years. This nation found its independence in 1776. Everything that we know that is old is not old compared to 430 years. For 430 years, the people of God have been crying out to God for God to be faithful to the covenant. And for 430 years, there has been silence. We started this lesson, we started this series by pointing out in that chapter one, it doesn't seem like God is very active. Pharaoh is very active, but the creator, the one who said, if you are faithful to me, me, I'll be faithful to you and you will be numerous. The people are being punished for being numerous. And they're crying out to this God. And God is Deathly silent. Well, God's not silent anymore. God is active. God is actively showing Pharaoh who is the boss. And we get to chapter 11 and chapter 12, and God is something more than just creator. There are many gods in the ancient world. At this point, in all of our narrative, in Genesis and Exodus, God has only been a tribal God. God is the God of 
Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is the God of this particular family. And while there seems to be other God-fearers or people who know about God in the world, it's not like the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is really competing for popularity with, for, for instance, the Egyptian gods. It's kind of just a cute little religion for this slave people. He's not really a powerful God. The powerful gods are Osiris, who's the God over the Nile, the God who decides when the Nile will flood and the life cycle of Egypt that affects millions and millions of ancient people. That God is powerful. Or there's God, the God Seth of storms that decides when the rains will come in Egypt and the land will bring forth new life. There will be food for both animals and people. Or the god Re, which is the sun god, who is venerated in Egypt above all other gods because it is so powerful. Everything else depends on this god. Or Hathar, who's the god of cows and livestock. Cows are venerated as holy things in Egypt. Or the god Thoth of magic which is like the chief export of, Exodus, of Egypt. It's what their nation is known for, their magic. And so when the arrival of a Pharaoh that does not fear God or know Jacob raises and he enslaves the people for 430 years, these are the gods that Egypt worships because of course they do. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is nowhere to be seen. Well, that changes. One by one, God attacks these gods. Osiris, the god of the Nile, is put to shame when the Nile becomes blood. The Nile itself dies. And everything in the Nile and everything with, associated with that god dies. And then the god Seth is humiliated when not he, but God brings on storms of hail. And Ray. The god Ray is totally blacked out with long darkness. The text says a darkness that you can feel. Darkness personified. And Ray is humiliated. Cows and Hathar are humiliated. Thoth, the god of, god of magic, is put to shame. One by one, this god who says to Moses, I will bring my signs so that you will be to Pharaoh a god. The NRSV this morning was probably trying to be respectful, uh, non-sacrilegious, but the text actually says, God says to Moses, you will become a god to Pharaoh. Not like a god, not a highly respected person, but you will become as if you were a god to Pharaoh. And that's what happens. These nine plagues come, and one by one, the gods of Egypt are brought low. The magicians of Egypt are brought low, and it becomes clear that this cute little tribal god, the god of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which was easily put to shame with 430 years of slavery, is being humiliated. And there is one god that is powerful, the god that Israel proclaims created the world with words. And then God comes here in chapter 11 and says, one more. One more plague. There is no God of Egypt for the firstborn. This is not necessarily an identified God of Egypt. It is instead what the ancient world identifies as their hope for any future. If these gods are good to us, our children will live. If our children will live, our legacy will go on. If our legacy goes on, it means that we lived in goodness, that we honored the gods, that, that life continues. And God says when Pharaoh decides to kill the, every, every, Israelite to, every Israelite male two years old and, and younger, God says there in chapter 4, I'm going to do the same thing to Pharaoh. And now, now is the time, now is the night when God is going to do what God said he's going to do. And he will wipe out 
the future of Egypt. And all of their identified gods and all of the gods that maybe aren't identified, but the things that they hold close to their hearts, well, they will know once and for all who the creator God is. And so there at night, God goes through Egypt and passes over the Israelite encampments. And in some parts it says the destroyer goes through. In other parts it says God himself goes and visits Egypt. And at midnight, every firstborn of Egypt dies. Some people will say, this is more gracious than Pharaoh. Pharaoh's policy of killing all of the first, every two-year-old boy and younger would eventually lead to total devastation of the people. It would eventually lead to a totally wiping out the Israelite people because there was not a time limit on that, that edict. Eventually, the Israelites would die, and, and some will say, well, look, this is just going to wipe out a generation. This is just going to wipe out the firstborn of that generation. Some will say that God here is being merciful, but that's hard. That even in itself doesn't let God off the hook of what God is doing. And so we come this morning and we read this text and we say, this is the word of God for the people of God. And it's hard. For 430 years, the Egyptians have been beating, punishing, tormenting the Israelite people. I mean, can we imagine how many times an Egyptian taskmaster told an Israelite parent, watch this while I whip your child, while I beat your child, while I force your child into servitude. And for 430 years, generation after generation after generation after generation of Israelite probably just wishes and prays for the day when they get to see an Egyptian suffer like they are suffering. They're praying for the moment for vengeance and comeuppance when an Egyptian parent will get to feel the misery that they have felt as slaves for 430 years. And then the night comes and a cry rises up from Egypt unlike one that has ever been heard before. And the prayer of the Israelites for vengeance has been answered. And they don't celebrate like they thought they would. There is no time spent in either chapter 11 or 12 with any sort of victory. It's just sorrow. It's just sad. Yes, this God has proven to be more powerful than any God of Egypt. He's put all the other gods of Egypt to shame. That's true, but um, the Israelites did not feel as happy in this moment as maybe they thought they would. They are just there realizing that the God who holds life and creation in his breath also holds destruction. In the same breath, the God who created everything is both creator and destroyer. Life and death are always closer to each other than we might think. Waiting on God is often this dramatic. It is often this scary. We might say yeah, there's a difference between what God does and what Pharaoh does, and what God does is more merciful, and there, that's true to an extent, but at no point should we take the edges off this story. We need to sit with it and look at it. Our God creates and destroys. And so, as Israel is now free to go, and in fact being pushed out with urgency, they ask themselves, can we serve this God? Do we dare go into the desert serving this God? That's been the question of people who have experienced the visitation of God for all time. 
there's a man named John who was born extremely wealthy. And he was pulled into military service as he just kind of lived a life of decadence and happiness and parties and uh, got to spend whatever he wanted, having all the much, as much fun with his friends as he wanted. And he's pulled into military service and he's hurt in battle. And he's on his way back home, partying and living it up. He decides to stop at a temple, at a, a, at a shrine, at a church that's in ruins. And there, as he's just lost in life, he hears the audible voice of God. It says, John, John, go repair my church, which as you can see, lies in ruins. John is his English name. He's born Giuseppe of Assisi. He changes his name to Francis of Assisi, and he gives away his entire ridiculous inheritance of wealth and lives the life of poverty because he has decided that those words from Jesus were his words and that a life lived towards that voice is a life worth living so much better than the life he had. But in that moment of new life, he dies. Giuseppe of Assisi becomes Francis of Assisi or Saint Francis of Assisi who has been, some will say, the greatest example of living a life like Jesus that has ever walked this earth. Then there's Agnes. Agnes decides to give her life to Christ, to give her life to serving Jesus and serving the uh, the least fortunate people that she can find. And in the midst of serving those who are on the lowest level, part of the social ladder. She has great doubt. She doesn't feel God visiting her anymore. She thinks often of giving it all up, even though she helps so many people. And she writes to one of her confessors, in my soul, I feel just that terrible pain of loss, of God not wanting me, of God not being God, or God not really even existing. Her spiritual confessor writes back to her, and she decides that what she is experiencing is the same loneliness that Christ experienced on the cross. And so rather than running for it from it, she's going to live into it. She's going to live into feeling like the God who's both creator and destroyer has left her. And Agnes, whose Christian name is Mother Teresa, decides to stay with the poor and to give life to those who are on the lowest rung of Calcutta because she learned that life and death are always closer to each other than we remember. Dr. Martin Luther King thought about giving up. He received death threats after death threats, sometimes 30 to 40 a night. One night he got a call at his home, and it was particularly troubling. And he sat down at his kitchen table, and he said, Lord, I'm down here trying to do what's right but I am afraid. I must confess I'm losing my courage and so would have we if our children and our wives were being threatened with bombs and being murdered and it had happened to others. And then he said, I could hear an inner voice saying to me, Martin Luther, stand up for truth. Stand up for justice. Stand up for righteousness. I will be at your side. And as we all know, violence did not turn away from him, but he kept going, walking hip to hip, shoulder to shoulder with God, because saying yes to God often means saying yes to losing the gods that we had loved. Saying no to the gods that we had hoped for for our future. We pray so much for God to be visible, for God to show up, for God to be clearly directing us. But what we often forget is that every time God shows up and says yes to someone, it often means that the gods that they have loved will die. That the parts of themselves that were connected to those gods must die. And so... The prophet Elijah says yes to God and lives a life of poverty. He's fed at one point by ravens. 
And then his, his apprentice, Elisha, is born a rich kid. But when Elijah comes calling and says, God's calling you to be up next, Elisha gives up everything. He says he burns it. He burns everything for God. And John the Baptist lives in the desert and eats bugs and is beheaded by his own king for saying yes to God. And so this morning, as Israel wakes up, the Egyptians are coming to them and bring their gold and their silver, and they're saying, take it, leave, get away from us. Go into the land that your God has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey, a land of life spilling over with life. Go, go there now. And as you go, pray for us. And this is the ending to this part of the story. Pharaoh says to Moses and Aaron, pray for me. And in that statement, we learn that Pharaoh has become a God-fearer. Pharaoh has become a God-worshipper, even though he's asking Moses and Aaron to do it for him. Pharaoh fears the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Well, why wouldn't he? This is the God who has both life and death in his voice. The Israelites are turning towards the open desert, and behind them, Egypt, Egypt still cries, still mourns. And they have a decision to make, a decision that they will wrestle with in the coming days and months and years. Do we really want to be alone in the desert with this God? Uh, this is a scary God. This is a God of true power. Do we really want to go worship and serve this God? Do we want to love the God who holds both life and death in his voice, in his breath? And so there's, there's a lot we can relate to. Uh, everyone in this room, everyone who's a serious disciple of Jesus, I am certain, has given things up in their life. You have had to feel to continue following this God like you are letting parts of yourself die. That's a big part of discipleship. <laughs> As Jesus is teaching his disciples what following him will look like, he, he says, you will pick up your cross and you'll follow me. To new life with Jesus always means carrying our cross. It means dying to ourselves and the gods that we have loved. And so... I'm interested in that. I'm interested in the ways that we as mature disciples of Jesus must embrace dying as we long for new life. But what I think I'm most interested in this morning is what a church would look like that is more comfortable with dying to ourselves. What is a community of priests look like? How does someone in our context, in this neighborhood, in your neighborhood where you live, where your job, where you work, how does somebody, could, how could somebody be so like an Egyptian that they have so many other gods, maybe not Osiris and Ra and Thoth, but the gods of their own loves? How would they love their gods so much that they would hate our God? And how might we behave in such a way that they would say, I might want to die to love your God. I might want you to pray for me. The Egyptians are giving their gold, their silver, and their prayers to the Israelites as they shove them out. How can Northside be a place that so embodies God, a God of no rival, the people would know us and say to us, I am willing to die to live your life. I am willing to die and let my gods die and let my future die to follow your God into the wilderness. That's what church does. 
We are the only institution that does not only exist for ourselves and for our own growth. We exist for those people who today hate our God. And we exist to live in such a way that when they see our lives, they say, I think I'm willing to die to live that life, to follow that God wherever he leads. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ go with you this week, wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness. May he protect you in the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at all the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again to these doors. Would you stand as we worship? hate when people talk about the weather, um, but I'm going to start my message with it today. Uh, so yesterday morning, the weather was amazing. Um, it was probably the first time in six months that I was excited to be outside, right? Um, and it just felt so good. Like, I just wanted to, like, like raise my arms out, like, yes, this is so great. Um, so as a person who loathes hot weather, even though I live in Texas, um, I look forward to the changes that fall brings, like I'm sure many of us do. Um, but no matter how much I love the changing seasons, one of my worst qualities is that I hate change in my own life. Um, I view it through a lens of fear. Um, so I, I cling to the ways something was, often because it's comfortable. When I see change happening on the horizon, uh, all I can think about is the ways that it can go wrong um, and how I may end up unhappy. Uh, and even though I know in my head that change is the only constant in life, uh, my heart still fears it. Um, but as a Christian, I know that I need to welcome life's changes. Um, much like David's messages about Exodus the last few weeks, um, God creates new life in us sometimes by creating change that can feel scary. Change can be painful um, because of what we may lose in the process, um, but that change uh, often leads to rebirth and new life in new ways. Uh, as 1 Peter 1.23 says, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. As Christians, we must make ourselves open to the changes life brings because we are open to the changes God makes uh, and is making within us. Uh, will you pray with me? Lord, may we as Christians embrace the changes in our lives with open arms. May we welcome them with confidence that comes with being your people, even when it's hard. 
In the season of change, may we live as your servants. May we be truly humble before you and others. May we use well the opportunities and gifts you place in our hands, serving you and others for your glory. May we seek after what really matters, offering ourselves to you in every facet of life, in honor of the gift your Son made in his sacrifice for us. In his name, amen. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. When I survey the some fun news to announce this morning. We had a very ambitious goal for Global Mission Sunday. We hoped to raise $120,000 for Global Missions, which is a lot of money for one week to collect from a group of people. Uh, And uh, I'm happy to announce that while we have not met that goal yet, we did raise at this point $110,000 thousand dollars for global missions yes this is still my go around first go around i'm still learning about north side and its giving habits but i am told that normally at this point we are not nearly as far along we are going to get our goal and we're going to get our goal because of your sacrificial giving uh, the giving that kind of money uh, means that it, it had to hurt a little to give it and uh, that means that it was sacrificial and that is really great. There's any time you have that successful of a fundraising campaign, there's uh, as many stories, as many fun stories that go along with it as there are people who gave. But one of the really fun stories you may have seen in an email already this week 
is that when you added up all the coins and all the change from our children and all the pledges and gifts and checks from our young people, uh, the people from 0 to 18 at this church gave $1,300 to Global Mission Sunday. Yeah, yeah. Um, That is a lot of coins. (laughs) That is a lot of allowance money. And um, what that says to me is that this church means what it says when we say that our young people are full participants of the family of God. They are the church of the future, but not just the church of the future, the church of now and the church of the future. And I love that they have adults in their lives that are teaching them the joys of investing in God's eternal kingdom now. And I am really, really proud to be at a church with adults and young people that teach our young people what it means to be a true disciple of Jesus, that they don't have to wait till they're adults to be a true disciple of Jesus. And giving is only one example of that, but giving means a lot. It means that uh, you're willing to invest not in yourself, not in your own future, but in God's kingdom. And so I am really proud this morning to be at this church uh, that believe so much in investing in God's kingdom outside of this wall. So, uh, Northside, give yourself another round of applause. A very, very exciting morning. Thank you, David. Uh, that's an exciting announcement. Um, thank you for being here today. Um, we have classes for all ages beginning at 10.30. Uh, Stick around for that, and to learn more about our adult classes, visit nscoc.org slash classes. A couple of things we want you to be aware of coming up. Uh, 345 Student Ministry meets today from 4.30 to 6 in the Children's Department. Uh, We'll have a time of worship, play some games, and welcome our new third graders. Snacks will be provided, and uh, if you have any questions... Contact Ms. Coco. Uh, this Saturday, uh, you are invited to engage. Uh, join us for our next contemporary praise service Saturday at 5 p.m. in the youth room and come experience a powerful time of worship, prayer, and encouragement. Hope to see you there. At Northside, we believe prayer is powerful and important. Uh, If you would like to pray with someone today, uh, we would love to pray with you. If you're online, uh, simply click the Request Prayer button. And if you're here in person, uh, if you'll make your way to the back of the room, our shepherds would be honored to pray with you today. Share your prayer prayer requests with us anytime at nscoc.org slash prayer. Let's be standing together as we sing. There is beyond the azure blue A God concealed from human sight He tinted skies with heavenly hue And framed the worlds with His great might There is a God, He is alive In Him we live and we survive From the star God A life was willing there to give That he from sin might set man free And evermore with him could live There is a God, he is alive In him we live and we survive From the star God created Thank you.